welcome, uh, thank you all for joining this webinar about the solid state uh, lighting. My name is uh, Clemens Valens and I work for Elector and I will be uh, co-presenting this webinar with uh, George Resco, a senior applications engineer at uh, Microchip. Uh, George Resco is the one who put this uh, presentation together and so he knows everything about our subject. So hi George, uh, how are things in Florida today? Oh, it's a beautiful day, sunshine and excellent temperatures and no hurricanes okay that's good so we you won't you won't be uh, be interrupted then that's right okay um this webinar is intended for people interested in the solid state lighting uh, also known as leds uh, we will discuss terminology and have a look at the drivers and control techniques uh, for solid solid state uh, lighting applications and this webinar is an introduction to a microchip university course on this subject. Um, the webinar is divided into several blocks intended to give you an idea of the complete course. After each block, uh, if needed, uh, we will highlight a few points. Uh, if you have questions, maybe we can answer them then. Uh, don't worry if you can't really follow along with the full presentation, uh, because you should take the real class when you have the time for it. And it's much longer than this webinar. It requires at least uh, two hours. When you complete the class, you will be awarded a certificate. Um, at the end of this webinar, uh, you can ask questions. You do this by typing them into the Q&A chat box on the right bottom corner of your screen. There. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards on the Electra TV channel for replay. And I will say this again because people always ask this. This webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards on the Electra TV channel for replay. Uh, having that said, uh, let's get started. Hello and welcome to Microchip University. My name is George Rasko and I will be your lecturer for this course entitled An Introduction to Solid State Lighting. The majority of the course will cover the use of white LEDs as a light source for architectural lighting applications. The course will cover the electrical and optical aspects of LEDs, and at the end, there will be some special topics including lasers, MEMS, lighting controls, and a smattering of other topics. Let's get into a few more details about the entire course agenda for Introduction to Solid State Lighting. The focus will be on general lighting, architectural lighting, and we'll cover a few descriptions and details of what's meant uh, in the context of this course. The course will go into a bit of the lighting vocabulary, the various words and phrases that you will come across when looking into this topic and what they mean and how to interpret them. We will talk about the characteristics of various lights. Although we will be talking mostly about LEDs and specifically white LEDs, we will also talk about LEDs in comparison to other lights, specifically compared to the incandescence, compact fluorescence, and such. Then we will go into the more electrical side of the discussion. We will cover LED drivers linear and switching both, but we won't go into the details of power conversion. That's a big topic and it's far more suitable for other courses that are purely electrically focused. Then we will talk a bit about lighting controls, both wired, wireless, and the various types out there. Then the, under sort of the special topics, we will talk about lasers, MEMS, and certain other things that have come up more recently in the topic of architectural lighting and a few of the special cases then under sort of the final hot topics, we will specifically talk about ultraviolet, which because of COVID has become an extremely popular topic for the world of lighting. Let's begin our look at the vocabulary of lighting. The first word we will look at is lumens. Lumens is the total amount of apparent light from a lamp. Total meaning added up in all directions, and apparent, meaning that it is weighted with the weighting of how the human eye perceives the various colors in the light. The human eye can see from about 400 nanometers, which is in the violet range, to about 700 nanometers on the red side, and with a peak sensitivity of 555 nanometers in the green. So it is not a uniform weighting 
of the light. The next word we will look at is Lux, not Luxor, which is a casino in Las Vegas. Lux is the apparent, weighted by the human eye, intensity of a light on a surface. So this is lumens per square meter. For example, full moon on a clear night is one Lux. 10 Lux is approximately one foot candle, another familiar unit of light intensity. 10 lux is about the brightness that typical street lights will use for turning on at night, that they want to turn on when the light gets below 10 lux. And then other typical levels of uh, lux and a little bit of lighting humor about what the meaning of a foot candle could be. The next word will be efficacy, and we will start by saying what it isn't. Efficiency is the ratio of two numbers with the same units. So in the electrical world, electrical efficiency is the power out over the power in. Efficacy is the ratio of two numbers with different units. And in lighting, we talk about the efficacy of lamps in lumens per watt. That is to say, the human weighted lumens, the apparent output of the light per electrical watt in. Would you like to add something to uh, what we just saw, George? Uh, the only comment I was going to make is that, um, you know, modern lighting, if you go to the uh, home improvement store and buy a light bulb now, you will see the lumens rating for that light bulb on the side of the box. So this is something that is now uh, in the public realm. It's not something that's just a, a boutique uh, thought from the, the lighting community. Okay, I have indeed seen that on my uh, IKEA light bulbs. Um, okay, well then we can, uh, we will continue. Huh? Let's continue our look at the vocabulary of lighting. Our next word is candela. It is the apparent, human eye weighted intensity of a light source. We're talking about the light coming from a source, not the intensity of a light on surface. This is lumens per steradiant, steradiant being a measure of the solid angle of the light being emitted from a source. A candle has an apparent intensity of about one candela. Now let's have a quiz about our understanding about the vocabulary of lighting. If you build a greenhouse in Colorado to grow herbs indoors with artificial light, are you significantly concerned about the lumen output and efficacy of your lamps? And the answer is no. Plants are green because they reflect green light to your eyes. Giving plants green light or white light that contains a lot of green is a waste of energy. One handy reminder, lumens are for humans. Let's go further with this idea. In your lighting optimized greenhouse, what would the theoretical color of your plants be? And it would be black. Ideally, all the light you shined on your plants in your greenhouses, they would absorb. But this isn't realistic. Sometimes, our eyes aren't the right tool for evaluating a lighting application, and that's the point here we're trying to make. In many greenhouses, the light looks magenta or purple to our eyes because it's a mix of red and blue with not much green in it because the plants aren't going to get much use out of shining green light on them. Another example of when our eyes aren't the best example is when it's for wildlife. Florida and Hawaii have turtle light requirements for coastal homes because hatching turtles get confused by white lights. They think it's the moon and go the wrong direction trying to find their way back to the salt water. So they allow amber lights to be used on coastal homes because these don't distract or disorient the turtles. Another example of when our eyes aren't the best thing to use for evaluating lighting is in San Jose. There's the Lick Observatory on a mountaintop 
right there visible from downtown. And San Jose works with the Lick Observatory to keep the amount of stray light going up down to a minimum so that it doesn't interfere with the work of the astronomers. Let's finish up this section of the vocabulary of lighting with two phrases that are used in the area of color. The first one is color temperature, sometimes called CCT or correlated color temperature. It's a single number in units of degrees Kelvin, which tells us how warm or cool the light from a lamp appears to us. 2400 Kelvin is a yellowish light that you might see in a dim incandescent lit restaurant. 3000 Kelvin is the color of light you would expect in a general office environment. 5000 Kelvin, much more blue, is what is called daylight. The final phrase is color rendering index, CRI. It's a single number measure on a scale of zero to 100 of how faithfully light from a lamp reproduces eight pastel standard color samples. These samples are called R1 through R8. There are actually eight additional samples, R9 through R16, that are saturated colors, and those are also looked at when looking at higher performance lighting. But CRI only looks at these first eight pastel samples. Lamps that have OK color rendering are considered 80 CRI or so, and good lamps are up in the 90 and 90 plus area of CRI. There is a newer measure of color rendering called TM30, which is a much more complicated way of looking at how the light from a lamp reproduces the various colors in the environment. And this is a new thing that you might or might not see on lamps that you buy, while you will almost assuredly see what the CRI is. Would you like to add something to this, George? So once again, I, I've, uh, I, I'm, we've covered more of the vocabulary, and once again, um, the color temperature is something that you should be seeing now on any light bulbs that you buy, once again, at the Home Improvement Store. And um, one of the uh, things that will happen is that um, if you mix uh, different light bulbs into a multi-bulb fixture, um, you will see the difference between uh, 2700 Kelvin, 3000 Kelvin, 5000 Kelvin. Our, our eyes may not be the best instruments for measuring absolute uh, color, but our eyes are sensitive to the differences between the uh, various uh, colors. So uh, when in doubt, you, you best uh, be prepared to, to replace all the bulbs in, in your light fixture if you want it to look the best. Let's leave the vocabulary of lighting behind us and move forward with LEDs. What are LEDs? LEDs are 99% of solid state lighting. LEDs are light emitting diodes. And that means they operate off DC current and DC current means the current flows in one direction. They are low voltage devices, the blue LEDs that are the base of the white LEDs. I have about three to 3.2 volts drop. They are nonlinear and they are current controlled devices. They can be five times the efficacy of incandescent lamps. And this is the reason why LED lighting has taken over from incandescent lighting. Now, LEDs are not 100% efficient. They do get hot. They need cooling, otherwise they're going to be unreliable. They can be 10 times the reliability of an incandescent, but only if they are kept to an acceptable operating temperature. LEDs typically are given a diode symbol on schematics with some little arrows indicating the light emitting from them. And typically a white LED looks like something as I'm showing here. The 
current versus voltage is an exponential, nonlinear, and it tends to go to a resistive look once the current gets above a certain value. You'll notice on this current versus voltage scale that the uh, zero of voltage is off scale to the left. Now, when you look at the light output versus current in an LED, it's not linear, and it, there is something called droop. And there have been a whole lot of academic papers and PhDs written about what can we do about the droop phenomenon in LEDs, because if droop could be solved, then you could take LEDs and drive them harder and harder without having lower and lower efficacy, which is what happens presently. Now here's another quiz. Why do white LEDs look yellow when they are off? And as a reminder, as I've said, white LEDs are actually blue LEDs with phosphor on top. And the answer is additive color mixing. When you take blue from white, you get yellow. So you have red and green mixing together additively. Note this is not subtractive color mixing, which is what you would get if you mixed paints. If you mix red, green, and blue paint together, that's subtractive color mixing, and you end up with a black center. And note on the upper right that when you add red and blue, and don't have green, you get a magenta color. And as I had mentioned earlier in agricultural lighting, when you don't have green light, because the plants don't absorb green light, you end up with lights that have approximately that color. Now let's talk about lighting controls. This is a, another topic that's very large, so this is going to be a very high level look at what's available and what to look for. The basic controls in lighting are on and off and dimming. But nowadays, commercial buildings, at least in California, are required to have daylight sensing, which is used to reduce the level of lighting when there's light coming in through the windows, and occupancy detection, which means that Conference rooms, for example, cannot just have the lights left on for long periods of time when there's no one inside and there's no activity. The way dimming is done varies. The simplest approach and best behave is linear dimming, but it's hugely inefficient. The next step up in dimming is phase cut dimming. This is the reason the Lutron company exists. There are, is dimming and on-off control that is done both with analog or digital connections. Some of the names and processes that do this are 0 to 10 volt, Dolly, DMX, Ethernet, power over Ethernet. Then even more modern approaches are wireless. Some of the approaches include Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, and LoRa. Let's look at phase cut. There's two basic approaches to phase cut. There's leading edge and trailing edge. Leading edge is the most prevalent, the cheapest way to do dimming with phase cut, and it's the original way, and it only takes two wires. It's still a good approach, an acceptable approach, when you use dimming of uh, low voltage lighting when you have magnetic transformers. As you can see from the picture, the, the signal, the current, is turned off at the zero crossing and it's uh, turned on somewhere during the AC cycle. We're showing both the voltage and the current here in these pictures. Trailing edge or reverse phase dimming turns on at the zero crossing and then turns off at a variable place in the waveform cycle. It's more complicated in that to implement this, at least to implement it reliably, takes three wires. You've got the hot and neutral and then the dimmed output. 
one of the things that came up when this was expanded was that it was discovered that a whole lot of installations, at least here in the U.S., didn't have the neutral wire available, so people weren't able to implement trailing edge or reverse phase dimming, even though it is better behaved, uh, because they would have to call an electrician and run extra wires to their switch box. So starting in 2011, the National Electric Code, the set of rules for most of the United States electrical uh, building code, um, now requires that even if you just have an on-off switch in a box, you need to have the neutral wire available. And also, with the advent of LED lighting, which is far and away more efficient, uh, there's a need for more low voltage lighting as well as reverse phase lighting because LEDs take so much less power that the leading edge dimmers were discovered to have excessively large minimum loads, which weren't a real problem when the load was an incandescent lamp. But with LED lamps, that minimum load for the leading edge dimmers became a real problem and trailing edge dimmers were needed. So the trailing edge are also the best way, the preferred way when you do low voltage lighting, but use electronic transformers. Once again, magnetic transformers are perfectly good. They're just large, expensive lumps of iron and copper. Electronic transformers are smaller and higher efficiency, but they don't behave well with the leading edge forward type dimming. Now, 0 to 10 volt dimming seems conceptually easy, but it's not. There are two completely separate approaches for it, and the nomenclature used is based on the controller. There's current sync controller, which is the most dominant one. You'll see it in your home. It's used in lots of architectural applications, and there's a IEC standard that covers current sync and it's claim to fame, and the reason it is so popular is it can use a very simple resistive potentiometer for control. However, um, in the theater world and for higher performance dimming, there is what's called current source 0 to 10 volt dimming. And uh, there are standards for this as well, the ANSI-ESTA, and it is active drive. The, the controller has to provide a current to the load in order to uh, provide the control function. And I do point out that my diagram does have some colors on it, and those are done on purpose. That if you are working in this realm, you should look for purple and gray wires. And the, the, one of the major issues with 0 to 10 volt dimming in general is that you need to think about isolation that 10 volts itself isn't a problem, but if it's 10 volts that's just derived directly from the utility mains, that can be a serious safety problem. Now, digital dimming, there's a lot of combinations and ideas. Now, the first one I'm mentioning is Dolly. Uh, it is the oldest one. It's comparatively slow. It's multi-drop in the sense that you can I uh, have a lot of different loads connected to one dolly string up to 63. And its approach to uh, the physical interface is using a current limited power source as part of the pair of wires. There is an IEC standard for this, and it tends to be more in Europe. The United States doesn't see a lot of dolly. DMX is a faster approach to digital dimming. It uses daisy chain and 512 loads can be attached. So it's much more popular for larger installations. If you go to a rock and roll concert, it's very likely that the lighting is going to be controlled by DMX. It's not robust enough that you want to do things that have safety implications using DMX. So please do not use pyrotechnic controls or moving sets up and down in the air using DMX. Now, Microchip has a lineup of PIC chips that have some UARTs that are enhanced, and they were targeted 
amongst other things, for Dolly and DMX type of applications. Power over Ethernet is a different way of going about things. You've got 48 volts DC, as in the telephony network, and there's a lot of different approaches to converting off of that. There is an industry standard called COAP, and it's uh, used to provide a benchmark of what it would be called compatibility. PoE has a lot of people that like to talk about it because it tends to be IoT friendly. You can have your telephone running off of power over Ethernet, the VOIP type network, and also security cameras. You just run your Ethernet and you've got power to your security camera and you've got a video stream coming back. There is one unique aspect, and Microchip isn't the only one who does something like this. It's dimming without a dimmer, as I call it. And what you can do is use a simple light switch to send on-off transitions, and if you have a smart light bulb, you can dim this way. A Microchip has a chip that is intended for this application. Digital wires have one interesting attribute. Um, typically, they don't require a licensed electrician to install. But be aware that, you know, there's still a lot of technical details that need to be considered when installing digital dimming with wires. Wireless digital dimming is a big topic right now. There's a variety of different ways to do it. Uh, one, Zigbee, many, medium range type of approach, and it's fairly mature technology. Bluetooth is very familiar. Uh, short range, simple. It's still developing it, its approach. But the number one issue with Bluetooth is that it works real well in a power limited audio application for your earbuds. But having your cell phone, for example, continuously active in order to talk to a mesh of Bluetooth is a bit of a problem. There is Wi Fi. We're very familiar with that within our cell phones and with our laptops. The medium range type of solution works in our homes, but it is complicated and that is a power hungry approach to control. There is a simpler version of Wi-Fi called MyWi. Microchip has stripped down Wi-Fi to something that it can run on its uh, small PIC controllers. And there is a version that supports mesh. There is an industry standard, and Microchip is one of the supporters of this, called LoRa. It is long range, and it's uh, mature, and uh, the types of applications that it's best suited for are like streetlights, where you might have a, you know, a few hundred feet between various nodes on your mesh. Now, there's two types of meshes, and I think it's important to talk just for a moment about them. There's something called a flooding mesh, where each node only knows its neighbors. It's very inefficient, and you can have packet floods, where every data packet goes through the whole mesh and is slow. But this is the way that Bluetooth made its Bluetooth mesh work. It's slow, and you have to be very careful in the implementations. Now, routed mesh, which is most, the most familiar version of this, is Wi-Fi. Each node on the mesh has a routing table to tell it how to get to other nodes, and you have to load that table with who can you talk to and how can you talk to them. It's a much more efficient way of having nodes talk to each other, and you have a much more complex adds and deletes, and it takes more local memory. It's not that flooding mesh doesn't take local memory, but it's a whole lot less. Now, some people are hoping that 5G is going to solve some of the problems, but 5G is a shorter range cell phone solution. And so there's going to be a build out problem with 5G. Uh, there's a YouTube video, I don't know if it's still available, of the CEO of T-Mobile running a spectrum analyzer showing how a 5G spectrum is running and they're doing this at a trade show and when he takes a made up 
door, a uh, residential door, and closes it, you can see the 5G signal going away from the spectrum analyzer. Now, one other aspect of wireless, and I've done this, and I'll tell you exactly what I did as an experiment. You open your laptop, and if you have a sniffer, which essentially looks at the entire network, uh, how many networks can you see? When you turn on your laptop and look at Wi-Fi, it's not unusual to see here at my house, for example, I might see a half a dozen or so of my, you know, nodes on the Wi-Fi network, or uh, how many do you see with Bluetooth? Probably very few inside your house. But, for example, at a trade show, I opened up my laptop with a Bluetooth sniffer, and I saw over 400 Bluetooth nodes that I could access with my laptop. And as a simple word to the wise, if you can see them, they can see you. It was a, a, a long uh, video. Maybe uh, you would like to add something to it, George? Um, only that the, the security issues are st still with us and they're, they're not just unique. They're not unique to lighting. Um, every uh, thing that people talk about on the IOT realm is, you know, there's a security issue that needs to be dealt with everything from key fobs for your car uh, and, uh, you know, lighting controls are just one of them. The, you know, you, if you use a wireless doorbell uh, uh, on your, on your house, I mean, there's, there's people that can come by your house and see if, if your your doorbell is active and it, if it's in use. So the security aspects are, are, are still being worked on. Um, the world of, of Bluetooth is one that's very active right now because it's, it's attractive because um, everybody's got it built into their cell phones and it's low power, comparatively low range. Um, what's being done is trying to break B Bluetooth into pieces so that there's the continuous on part of Bluetooth, which, you know, if your lights are screwed into their light sockets, uh, they can get power and, and look for commands and controls, but your, that your lights will work even though you're, you turn off your cell phone. So uh, that, once again, is one of those uh, newer um problems shall we say and the the industry lighting industry internationally um hasn't come to a, a closure or any common ground in a lot of ways um unfortunately in these more complex control systems and control methods uh both wired and wireless the uh industry standards are lagging the uh, experiments <laughs> in the in the field so okay we have uh, one uh, video left shall we continue sure here is a collection of references for more information about lighting architectural lighting and some of the topics that were covered in this series of uh, uh, presentations first uh, the IEEE uh, recommended practice about looking at flicker. Um, there is a specifically a graphic chart which shows how sensitive the eye is with respect to the frequency of the flicker that is uh, very much considered the benchmark of this type of um, investigation and, and potential uh, regulation. Energy Star here in the U.S. is the basic set of federal regulations for a variety of items, including lamps. And the latest set of specs is the 2017 edition. And they are also proposing, they being Energy Star, um, regulating flicker. So they have some draft specs that are out there to uh, potentially make LED lamps more attractive to the consumer by making the light quality higher. Now, the Department of Energy, which operates Energy Star, put out a introductory paper about Flickr and some measurements about uh, various lamps. And the authors, uh, Poplowski and Miller, 
are from the Pacific Northwest Labs, and they were paid to do the work for the Department of Energy. California has its own and a very extensive set of regulations, and they cover both appliances and lamps, and, and so they go under the uh, topics of Title 20 and Title 24 in the California legal structure. Um, there are regulations about building lighting as well as for individual products. There are also some test specs and ways of measuring that are documented elsewhere in the California regulations. They go by the um, descriptions of JA8 and JA10. Uh, specifically, California has a very extensive set of requirements as far as how to measure flicker, and it involves taking uh, a number of readings and running Fourier transforms and then uh, checking the various uh, results as a function of frequency. The other way to learn about lighting is hands-on. The biggest trade shows in the United States are Strategies in Light, focused on LEDs, and Light Fair, which is more uh, the next step up into fixtures. The trade show world is now coming back. Uh, Light Fair is going to have a 2021 live trade show in New York at the towards the end of the year. So if you want to know more, uh, it's worth your while to look into it and potentially attend. Europe every two years has a very large trade show called Light and Building, which is the, sort of the benchmark of their entire uh, building trades and lighting world. Now, there's a large extensive document put out by Lutron. Uh, Lutron was founded by Joel Spira, and he invented phase cut dimming using Triax back in 1958, and his initial dimmer product was the original founding benchmark of solid state dimming. And there's a document called an overview of LEDs and dimming that's 172 pages long that you can get from the uh, Lutron website. Lutron bought an LED lighting company out of Texas, Ketra, back in April of 2018. And uh, Ketra has some interesting products that uh, you might want to just take a glance at. Now, one of the people who got the Nobel Prize in Physics was Suji Nakamura, and there was a book written before he won the Nobel Prize uh, by a guy named Bob Johnstone, and it's called Brilliant with an exclamation point after it. And the Nobel Prize was really for inventing the blue LED. There were three Japanese inventors, and Suji Nakamura was one of them. And uh, he is also somewhat famous because he does not have a PhD. He was not an academic. He was working for a company called Nichia in Japan. And by uh, good fortune, his uh, management supported his work and uh, originated in the uh, discovery that gallium uh, nitride could be used in spite of the defect density. If you're going to read this book, um, be sure to get the 2015 edition, which came out after the Nobel Prize was awarded, and don't get the 2007 original. Wait a minute, what is this? It's me, a younger me, before I had my beard, and what I have next to me is the actual Nobel Prize in Physics won by Shuji Nakamura for inventing, along with two other guys, the blue LED. It turns out that the you win the Nobel Prize, they only give you that one Nobel Prize. And if you want to put something on your mantle while you lock up the original, you have to go out and buy a copy. But what you're seeing right there is the actual original Nobel Prize. Thank you very much, George, for your presentation. It was very interesting uh, indeed. We will now go to the uh, Q&A session. Um, let me first say that um, I pasted the link to the university course in the chat box. And I think 
during the webinar there was a QR code. Oh, here it is also. No, this is an electron QR code. There was a QR code to uh, take you directly to the uh, microchip university course. If you have any questions, uh, George Resco is, of course, the specialist. So this is the moment to ask your questions. I will switch to the Q and A mode, which is here. Oh well, my! <laughs> Sorry, that would take a lot of uh, head scratching and math. I don't know. It, it, it will. It will be a bajillion photons. <laughs> I, I honestly have a, don't don't know anything about how how many photons there are, and I, that that would take a, a bit of going back to my old physics textbooks. <laughs> Sorry. Well, actually, there was a good answer from um, I can't see who it, the answer was uh, as many photons as are emitted from a full moon. So, <laughs> that doesn't tell you much. Yeah. Uh, just be aware that photons, uh, you know, all, all photons aren't the same. And that's one of the um, in interesting idiosyncrasies of light in that, you know, um, now with ultraviolet being an interesting side topic with trying to disinfect for COVID that just, you know, make sure you understand if you uh, go back to your old physics textbooks that, um, as you go to the left, as you go towards violet, ultraviolet, the photons become individual photons are more powerful. So it's it's not you know those those red photons that the uh, in for, that are coming off as heat in the incandescent lamp, those are comparatively low energy, and those uh, the, the the far UV photons uh, they can do a lot of damage, uh, not just to bad bacteria, but also just as a safety comment, um, do not expose yourself to to that UVA and vacuum UV because there it, it can do physical damage, not just give you a suntan. Certainly, don't we use UVC for um, cleaning uh, uh, face masks? There are, yeah, I mean, there have been proposals actually when uh, COVID first came out um, that there was a shortage of hospital equipment. There was hospital gowns and hosp and masks. And there were some uh, uh, proposals to uh, use light to disinfect. The problem with using light to disinfect is, ob is pretty obvious. There are shadows. So unless you've, you can, uh, if you're really, really worried about um, disinfecting, your uh, light may not be the best solution. And um, I know that um, some of the solutions involved like aerosol hydrogen peroxide because that gets into everything. But I think uh, I think in, in the class, uh, you'll see a, a billboard that I took a picture of that um, there are, that uh, the local hospital near me uh, bought a, UV, a robot to go through and uh, you know, blast UV around the, um, the rooms as it, um, it traversed at night. Um, so that is that is an interesting thing. The New York City subways also used ultraviolet to try to disinfect the subway cars. Uh, that's uh, still, uh, I think they've stopped doing it just like I think the hospital has stopped doing it, but, they are, but it's still a very hot topic. Um, probably in, in my estimation, the biggest use is going to be um, there's going to be adding ultraviolet into the ductwork of commercial industrial buildings so that as air is circulated through the HVAC, it will be cleaned with ultraviolet and putting it in the ductwork means you don't expose people to it. So I, I think that is coming, it might even become a regulatory thing that, that'll be required, uh, specifically in hospitals, I can see it very much happening. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here. It should, be, uh, should, should interest you. What is the best light frequency for theater color filters? Well, I, I, I don't think that there's a best, but uh, you know, theater lighting um, almost uh, across the board starts with whitish light, as white as they can make. Um, the good news you know, or, and the bad news, in the, in the old days, 
um, the incandescents had to be driven real hard to get them to look white, which is why the yellowish color temperatures uh, predominated in, in incandescent lighting is because fundamentally the incandescent lamps lasted longer. So th there isn't a, a, a best frequency, but just be aware if you go into the class, I've got some spectrums of, of typical LEDs that LED lighting, white lights, only looks white to us humans and that it's got a, almost a, all across the board, all of them have a blue peak that needs to be dealt with. And one other thing that I'll, I'll just give you a, you know, a war story as it were, um, a large entertainment company that shall remain nameless was using um, LED lighting for the first time and they were filtering it. But instead of using absorptive filters, which are probably you know, a piece of colored glass or something equivalent to that, they were using dichroic filters. Dichroic filters means they actually reflect back the uh, unused, undesirable colors back and they only pass the uh, desired colors. Well, the problem is, is that incandescent lamps can take a whole lot of heat and abuse because of, of the glass and all that. But LED lighting, if you, if you reflect back a whole lot of the, the, the light because you're just filtering it, you'll overheat the lamps. They're not designed for um, that type of application where you, um, you know, say you want, you know, a, Blue, you know, green light coming coming out. Well, if you reflect all the red and blue back at that LED, it's going to overheat and it's going to fail pretty quickly. So uh, be forewarned and forearmed that that uh, that that you best not abs uh, abuse your your lights, uh, your specifically your LED lights. Choose the right filter. Then we have a vocabulary question: How much is one <laughs> bajillion? I think it is uh, one bajillion plus one or so. Yeah, it's it's. I I think from uh, if you if you saw the movie Back to the Future, it's it's probably around uh, a Googleplex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a more serious question: Which lighting control has the lowest EMI? Almost across the board, that linear. Um, back in the when when dinosaurs roamed the land to dim incandescent lamps, uh, theaters would had literally tubs of salt water, and they would you you know put an electrode into it, and that, you know that you would you would um, change the resistance in series with the light that um, uh, in order to to dim the lights. And it worked great, but it was horribly inefficient. EMI, um, there's actually two worlds of EMI. The um, EMI, what I'll call the, the more higher frequency EMI is set by the edge rates um, used in the dimming. If you look at phase cut dimming, and if you look at those examples just shown here, you'll see that there's a pretty fast transition in current. And so that can generate, that generates the, the, the EMI that gets, um, gets uh, uh, broadcast. Uh, now th there's a second low frequency that deals with the topic of power factor, that how do you take the power out of the um, utility? And that's in the audio frequency range up into the you know tens of kilohertz and that unfortunately that tends to be shared <laughs> through the power lines and so you can end up the more familiar um, um, buzz that you sometimes hear um, when when uh, when you've got lighting controls that are phase cut um, mo more than likely it's the low frequency stuff that is that is the problem, and just one other passing comment: um, the in, in the world of of uh, magnetics, um, you can run into problems with that phase cut and in in fast transitions, and you will the magnetics will um, there's a phenomenon called magnetostriction that where the the, the actual item um, 
changes size a little bit as it's being turned on and off quickly. And so you can actually hear it. And you know, the familiar buzz from old magnetic ballasts in, in fluorescent lights, it's due to magnetostriction up in, up in, the, in there. So um, depending on what your problem is, an EMI problem, could be low frequency, could be high frequency. Um, it's easy to filter the high frequency stuff. It's, it, it's radio frequency and some small chokes. The low frequency stuff is tougher to filter. So that's a bit of a long winded answer to the, to your question. Uh, here we have another one. Is green light an LED more efficient, energy efficient as human eyes are more sensitive to green color? If you're talking about yeah, humans and lighting in, in a room, in a sense, yes, that is correct. And, and as a matter of fact, um, um, that is one of the idiosyncrasies of um, that light, people who design light bulbs, uh, lighting, um, trade off. Um, that the green light is, is um, efficient to, to, for our eyes to see. Now, obviously, any color doesn't look white. So the adding a bunch of colors and trying to make things look white is one of the, the big deals. But if you look at what are the most highest lumens per watt, the highest efficacy lamps typically have extra green. They typically um, don't have as much red and blue. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the other piece of it is that um, in the color rendering, um, making violet light is less, is more difficult. It takes more energy because those violet photons are higher energy than blue. So the most energy efficient, highest efficacy lamps typically use blue blue LEDs and uh, phosphors lathered on them, but it, those those lamps don't put out any violet. Now, uh, in, in the original days of, of LED lighting, there were people who were saying that, well, no museum should use um, uh, LED lamps because they put out all this blue and violet. Well, nowadays, that's not... No, that's not real because the amount of the amount of violet that an, an L, even a, a standard LED lamp puts out is pretty modest, and um, there have been some uh, big uh, um, research. There's a lot of research that was done to make sure that you know LED lamps uh, didn't fade various things. So, so yeah, it's a, once again a bit of a long-winded response uh, to it. Um, going the other end, um, the, the um, red end of the spectrum, as I commented about um, the um, color samples, the, the pastels versus the uh, saturated colors, um, R9, which is apple red, fire engine red, is the one that gets the most attention when you're talking about high color rendering index lamps that, um, yeah, you can make very efficient lamps, but they, your, your apple will look pink. So not necessarily a desirable result. Yeah. I'll leave it Good at that. Uh, for nice colors, you need white light. Um, yep. Then we have a question again about plants. If green plants uh, reflect green light, presumably it means that the color of light they are least interested in. What light is best for photosynthesis? Well, um, it turns out it varies plant to plant, actually. Um, uh, I, my, my example in the class, I, I, you know, I was a bit uh, flippant and comically about growing herbs in Colorado because Colorado was the first place that legalized uh, marijuana growing. And um, there's been a whole lot of research on what exact uh, light frequencies the, the individual um, plants want to use. And so the, the um, people that do indoor um, horticulture, uh, this is a big deal for them, you know, to, to opt, you know, if you're going to be running greenhouses with lights, 
if you're growing tomatoes, you might want to use a slightly different um, set of frequencies than if you're using uh, growing marijuana or growing something, some other uh, indoor vegetable. So there's no single answer for best because it turns out that the, that the, 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 the red and blue uh, parts of the spectrum, which are what are left when you take out the green, um, the, the various plants want various amounts. And so uh, best and, and is, is, is a relative thing depending on what you're growing. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, Elector published uh, together with uh, Wurt uh, a project for um, 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 plant growing light box, and they used um, special uh, plant LEDs, special agricultural LEDs for this. These are optimized LEDs for um, growing plants. It yeah, that's that's ago. very that's very popular for horticulture LEDs. Don't they don't put the phosphor on that um, uh, makes the green because the plants aren't going to use it. So um, yeah, and the, but the light, if you look at that um, additive color spectrum in the, in the presentation, you'll end up with a, a magenta looking light, at least it looks magenta to our eyes. And um, one, once again, passing uh, bit of uh, curiosity, uh, there is no such thing as the color purple. Purple is a, a synthetic color that we we see in our eyes, but violet is the is the color that that's in the spectrum. But if you look at the color spectrum, there is no color purple in the color spectrum. So you can you can amaze your friends with that bit of trivia. <laughs> we'll save that for the next next family dinner when we need some conversation. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question which is not a uh, bad question. When does light become dangerous uh, for the eye? Is there a scientific well, basis for it? Oh yeah, I mean, um, um, there's multiple things that can go wrong. Um, the basic, I mean, you don't just don't go outside and stare at the sun. That's a pure intensity damage to the eye because your, 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 your retina can only withstand a certain um, amount of intensity before there's damage, sometimes temporary and sometimes permanent. And yet there are thresholds for this. And then there is um, now with the interest in ultraviolet, there's um, more work going on in the eyes sensitivity, the skin sensitivity to ultraviolet. Um, uh, there's, um, when you go to deep ultraviolet, um, you can kill bacteria, you can kill COVID. Um, it's a dosage thing. Uh, a dosage um, is from an, uh, another vocabulary word, and that's the intensity times time. And so depending on what you're worried about, um, dosage can become a problem in the ultraviolet. Specifically, people are, are getting really excitable about it. And, but, um, as you go into those deep UVs, um, they don't penetrate very far. So there are um, proposals to go even further into the UV for disinfection to what's called vacuum UV, which is like I don't, 180 nanometers, I believe is, is sort of the center of that. And there are people saying that, well, this will be less dangerous to humans and it will be almost as dangerous to bacteria because um, the so there's various proposals based on how much dosage you can um, uh, take at various frequencies so if there's there's not one answer depending on you know is it an intensity problem is it a dosage problem and at what um, wavelength are we talking so uh, that's that's the, it, there, there's no simple answer. And yes, it's a, it's a big question in, in both the lighting research as well as the medical community. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have to stop now. Our hour uh, is full. Let me uh, uh, publish again the link in the chat box. Copy it. There it is. Those who didn't see it. So the full course is available at this link now in the chat box. 
uh, the recording of this webinar will be available at the Electro TV channel afterwards. So I think uh, next uh, Friday, upcoming Friday. Well, that's uh, tomorrow actually. Um, the next webinar from Elector is, I think, about components and production and scheduled for December the 8th. But it's in about uh, six weeks. Uh, so I will hope I hope you to see you there again. Um, and I'd just like to make a, make a mention that yes, there, this there is about a two hour set of, of presentations available on Microchip University on the Microchip website. That for this this what what you've seen here is an extract from that uh, bigger course. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, thank you all for uh, being with us, and uh, thank you, George. Of course, uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, webinar, a nice presentation, and very uh, interesting, useful information, and even some uh, less useful information. <laughs> Good for. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, and um, hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Um. Goodbye. <laughs>